Hey, you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. The capital city dwelling, middle of the bell curve, statistical average, first home buyer in mid-2011. How much did you pay for that median price unit you bought? RP Data told me it was about $400,000 for the median priced unit and about $450,000 for the median priced house. Anyway, how much did you borrow? 300 grand! Well, the ABS tells me you borrowed exactly 286,000. But okay, we'll go with 300 grand. But hang on, the median unit in capital cities was 400 grand minus the average first home buyer loan of 300 grand. That means you had 100 grand deposit. Hang on, let me work that out. 1 over 4 is a quarter, right? Hey, that means you had 25% deposit. Wow, I keep reading in the papers I'm doing well if I've got a 20% deposit, and you're just the average. And some banks will loan me money even if I've got a 3% deposit. Hey, how the hell did you save 100 grand cash money anyway? I mean, come on, even on your salary, the average Australian earnings, persons, full-time, adult, ordinary time earnings. So that means even after paying rent on your unit, maintaining your car, cost of living and partying in your 20s, you managed to save half of what you're actually paid in the bank each year for the last five years? Wow, well done. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, you're just over 30. The same age as most first home buyers. So you've had a bit more time to save. What's that? Oh, sorry, you guys are a couple. So you each save 50 grand, right? Okay. What was the last one? You got a bit of helping hand from your folks? Yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. And it's only fair, the property market's terribly unaffordable. Either way, you're just over 30. With 100 grand cash, you've been able to muster together. Theoretically, paying down a 20 to 25 year mortgage, you would eventually own that unit in your early 50s. Now, at current interest rates, which are historically low, that means it'll cost you another 450 grand to own the unit outright. To put it another way, think about how long it's taken and all the effort you've had to go and scrimp and save to get together 100 grand cash money. Now, averaging that total repayment on the loan over the loan period, if you're a single, you're going to have to double your scrimping and saving efforts in your 30s and 40s. Being on the average wage, do you think your pay is going to go up in accordance to these repayments? In this way, can you see why a well-meaning helping hand from your folks may not be such a good idea in the long term? The De Rossi children have been fortunate to have their parents' financial backing. It's not an apartment that I could have afforded on my own. I definitely needed some financial help. We're in business. So we came to an agreement where uh, we were both owners of the property. Perfect fit. And that made me feel much better. <laughs> and as a couple, you're also each going to have to double your scrimping and saving efforts despite having kids, school fees, time off work and life's inevitable mishaps. Keeping in mind these figures are not too far from the average first home buyer across Australia last year. Half the loans taken out by first home buyers were higher than these in value. But I know what you're saying. Don't try and scare me, APB. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics, and you're just using numbers to cloud the issue. But that's not how it works anymore. I won't literally end up repaying all that money to the bank. I'm buying the unit because it's going to go up in value, and I'm going to upgrade. Well, firstly, by buying the unit and signing your name on the loan, the bank is certainly expecting every cent of the outstanding 450 grand to come from somewhere. But okay, so rather than a place for you to live, you've bought the unit as an investment so you can upgrade. In other words, you're betting on a rising market, because there's a good chance you'll find you'll actually have to sit tight and repay the loan as just described. And if you bought in New South Wales, even the government is out to thwart your plans to upgrade your way out of paying down this loan, as they have, from the start of this year, pulled stamp duty exemption for future first home buyers on everything but new housing. First home buyers who raced to get in before the exemption was pulled have quite possibly raced to become the bottom rung of a stagnating upgrading ladder, as the government has now effectively bumped up your on selling price by $18,000. The genius behind making an unaffordable property market even less affordable for first home buyers is to coax them into new luxury apartments or way out into the sticks 
into off-the-plan new housing, thereby boosting construction and easing urban population congestion in the one fell swoop. And what's the New South Wales Government's new policy going to do now to demand for the thousands of speculative investments in Sydney, the empty one and two bedroom units holding out to sell at higher prices? And how about the many borrowers that have leveraged right up for investment with euphoric expectations during the boom times? And what consequences will there be for government stamp duty as turnover of the whole New South Wales property market slows due to a stagnating upgrading process? When the property market slows, they usually stimulate demand at the bottom of the food chain. What consequences will there be for house prices by restricting demand? Trophic structure is essentially the feeding relationships among organisms in a community. These feeding relationships are essential to the hierarchy of how this community works. Let's start at the bottom with our producers. As you move up the food chain towards that apex predator, you're seeing lots of different consumers past those producers. And it's because phytoplankton are so abundant that they can affect the whole planet. Without phytoplankton in the oceans, there wouldn't be any fish or turtles swimming around. Phytoplankton is the first meal in the ocean food chain. 30% of the carbon dioxide you emit is absorbed by the oceans, making them more acidic. And that's bad news for all kinds of sea creatures with hard shells or skeletons. This experiment shows the effect that more acidic seawater will have on tiny pteropods by the year 2100. Pteropods are important for a lot of species in the ocean. So it could be fish, it could be seals or whales that eat the fish. And don't forget humans. The little pteropod makes up roughly half the diet of ocean salmon. So if they go away, your favorite seafood may be a lot harder to get. Over the past 10 years, the increase in property prices has been mirrored by household repayments on increasing levels of debt. Rising prices and the ability to upgrade to a house has become an increasingly important part of the deal in attracting first home buyers into such large debt. But can the property markets part of the deal of rising prices even be sustained? Continually increasing debt levels and prices are inversely proportional to interest rates and deposit requirements. That is, in order for prices to keep going up, deposit requirements must keep shrinking to make higher debt accessible, and interest rates must keep shrinking to keep the higher debt affordable. But how much longer can prices keep rising anyway? Because both interest rates and deposit requirements have a practical limit of zero. They certainly can't keep rising forever. How many of us have thought, gee, with property prices the way they are, I don't know how my kids would even afford a unit. People of my age can remember uh, that we were paying 17% interest at one stage. Uh, now that was okay when you borrowed $30,000 for your first house and that was like twice your salary mm. in a year. Now when you're borrowing three or $400,000 and that's four or five times your salary, uh, the damage can be done really quickly. It's interesting to note the government's response to the debt problem. Oh, we, well, of course debt is high. It's, uh, it, it means, for example, as other people have said, that debt repayments are higher now than they were when interest rates were 17%. You know, the percentage of people's income going on debt repayments, the percentage of debt is higher. I think the best thing the government can do to help is to put downward pressure on interest rates and help the Reserve Bank do their job. It comes back to what I said before. The biggest thing the government can do to help is to put downward pressure on interest rates. You can, have other, you can do other things, but really, when it comes down to it, it's interest rates which are the killer, and what you can do as a government is to help put downward pressure on them. That's the biggest single thing that we can do. That's what my constituents say to me, and that's what I say back. Hmm. But even if you make the debt super cheap, it's not the debt people want, but the prosperity of ownership and potential wealth. As prices start to fall, more first home buyers see taking on such large debt is not in their best interest, and A plus B no longer equals C. Buying a property with so much debt is not true wealth, but rather wealth through debt. Since debt is money in this system, it creates the fantasy of wealth for a while, but fantasies must come to an end. But anyway, doesn't the whole idea of the average Australian having to pay down such large debt sound a little bit impossible? 
Doesn't that sound a bit ridiculous that the total value of Australian housing stock now stands at around $5 trillion, more than four times our annual GDP? Aren't we in a property bubble when property prices are bid up to such large amounts by the increased access to bank credit and subsequently higher debt which seems to take us further and further away from the availability of money in the economy to actually repay these loans? For most of us, the question, where does money come from, brings to mind a picture of the mint printing bills and stamping coins. Money, most of us believe, is created by the government. It's true, but only to a point. Those metal and paper symbols of value we usually think of as money are indeed produced by an agency of the federal government called the Mint. But fiat cash makes up only a very small proportion of money. Usually about 95% of all money is bank credit, created by someone signing a pledge of indebtedness to a bank. By signing the loan document and pledging our future productivity to repay the so-called loan. Most of us believe that banks lend out money that has been entrusted to them by depositors. Easy to picture, but not the truth. In fact, banks create the money they loan, not from the bank's own earnings, not from the money deposited, but directly from the borrower's promise to repay. The borrower's signature on the loan papers is an obligation to pay the bank the amount of the loan plus interest, or lose the house, the car, whatever asset was pledged as collateral. Once the borrower signs the pledge of debt, the bank then balances the transaction by creating a matching debt of the bank to the borrower. From the borrower's point of view, this becomes loan money in his or her account. And because the government allows this debt of the bank to the borrower to be converted to government fiat currency, everyone has to accept it as money. But the system pretends it's a loan of money, and repayment must be in money. The borrower is required to earn both the principal plus the interest in money within a limited time. The only place borrowers can go to obtain the money to pay interest is the general economy's overall money supply. But almost all that overall money supply has been created exactly the same way as bank credit that has to be paid back with more than was created. It is only the time lag between money's creation as new loans and its repayment that keeps the overall shortage of money from catching up and bankrupting the entire system. However, as the bank's insatiable credit monster gets bigger and bigger, the need to create more and more debt money to feed it becomes increasingly urgent. Most of us can keep up our payments while the money supply is increasing. However, if the money supply or total debt is decreasing, money becomes harder to earn due to its scarcity. Neither the bank nor the borrower has any means to ensure there is enough money in existence for everyone to pay back their bank credit. Which is what happened during the Great Depression. The money supply shrank drastically as the supply of loans dried up. By 1932, the money supply had been reduced by a third. Countless people were evicted from their homes because the money to make their mortgage payments simply ceased to exist. To maintain a functional society, the rate of foreclosure needs to be low. And so, to accomplish this, more and more new debt money has to be created to satisfy today's demands for money to service the previous debt. Banks can lower interest rates and encourage borrowing, but they can't expand the money supply unless cautious and reliable borrowers are willing to borrow. If the money supply or total debt is decreasing, money becomes harder to earn due to its scarcity. If the bank credit borrower fails to pay the bank principal plus interest in money, the bank takes whatever was pledged as collateral. And neither party has any control over the value of the collateral either. The collateral may plummet in value and be insufficient to cover the bank's liabilities, causing a book loss and threatening the security of all the bank's depositors. That's why a sudden shrinkage in the money supply caused by some defaults has the inevitable follow-up effect of causing more and more defaults and even more shrinkage of the money supply. 
This disastrous spiral cannot be turned around unless the government creates new money itself or goes deeply in debt to private banks in order to create enough new money to reorganize and rejuvenate the economy. And that's pretty much what happened in 2008 during the GFC. A fall in confidence resulted in a fall in borrowing and house prices, resulting in a fall in the overall money supply in the economy. The $40 billion stimulus package was then introduced to prop up the money supply and reinstate confidence in borrowing and house prices. But the problem with stimulus measures is when the debt has grown to high levels, a time of crisis will naturally lead to a decrease in confidence to repay such large debt. This manifests in the economy as a decrease in borrowing and consequently a decrease in the overall money supply. To aid the slowing economy, artificial government stimulus and more importantly dramatically low interest rates are introduced to restart confidence in borrowing. As outlined in my previous video, the 2008 stimulus package was in part the doubling of the first homeowner grant which saw a dramatic uptake in some areas such as Western Sydney. However, it was the RBA halving rates that restarted the housing market, cutting four whole percent, bit by bit, over the months September 2008 to April 2009, until they reached a point low enough for upgraders to buy back into the market. Uh, I think that was much more about Australians responding to low interest rates by saying, you beaut, now I can buy a much bigger, better home because interest rates are so much lower. So you put quite a bit of it to, down to greed, yeah? When everybody says that at, at, at roughly the same time, the main effect of that is just to bid up the price of houses. A lot of what was going on in the housing boom was people, established homeowners, people who are on their second or third home, saying now that interest rates have fallen, I can move closer to the city, I can move to a better, loca a better located house. It wasn't about it wasn't about first home buyers not being able to afford houses on the edge of the city. I'd like to get I think they've hit the nail on the head with this confidence thing. That it's about confidence of, um, of the people to go out there and borrow money. So while government intervention had the desired effect of a return to borrowing and reinstated the money supply, it was the means by which confidence and borrowing was reinstated that was artificial. And so, while it led to a returning confidence in ability to repay high debts, it had remained artificial confidence. And instead of just returning to previous levels of high debt, restoking the housing market with record low interest rates now resulted in even higher levels of debt generated under artificial conditions. And ultimately, higher levels of debt, future crisis or not, inevitably takes Australians back to the same problem of an even bigger lack of confidence in being able to repay even higher levels of debt. So unlike during the GFC, when one of the world's largest investment banks collapsed, this time around we're told confidence is being affected by a range of other factors. But could it be that it's the theme common to all of these? Just like in 2008, people are once again not confident with the current level of debt they're holding or considering borrowing just to afford their own most basic of places to live. That's why, in my view, it's still quite likely the government will attempt to stimulate the market again using first homeowner grants. This may seem ridiculous given the Rudd government grant did relatively little financially for many first home buyers that took up the previous grants. But ultimately, there aren't a lot of options to stave off the inevitable contraction of the money supply other than facilitate people into larger debt. Either government would choose to stimulate rather than face a contraction in the money supply and a collapse in the property asset values of Australian banks. While Australians may want to blame the banks, they should be under no pretenses that ultimately it will be the government representing the Australian people who borrowed the money that will end up wearing the fallout of any contraction in the economy. The inevitable contraction in demand for debt has already resulted in the current and proposed bank job losses. As banks now look to compensate for losses by holding out on RBA rate cuts, 
and even if the RBA slashed rates in half again and the commercial banks could afford to match these cuts, people are starting to lose confidence that house prices can rise forever. In a market with falling confidence, property values become even less certain. And with Australian loans being full recourse, there's no jingle mail option to simply send the keys back to the bank. As such, there would be a growth in refinancing and rescheduling of loans for those having trouble making repayments, as a pledge of debt is much more valuable to the banks than the properties themselves. The other thing we can do, we'll go to the bank and try to get them to modify your loan. Mm -hmm. Banks don't really want these houses. And since you can pay a reasonable amount, there is a chance we can get the banks to agree to modify your loan so you can stay in the house and, and keep your American dream. After the doubling of the first homeowner grant in 2008-2009, first home buyers have started to get it in their head that high debt cannot be solved with more debt. Uh, how are you going to get out of here? We'll dig our way out. <laughs> As 2012 goes on and we see less and less borrowers, interest rates will continually need to be lowered as to make monthly repayments even more manageable compared with rent, but the hidden cost is the commitment to the size of the debt. But in times of asset price deflation, it's more like debt money that becomes dead money and plain old cash takes on a whole new value. Have you noticed how things have become cheaper recently? A third of Australians own their properties outright, a third of them rent and a third of Australians hold a mortgage. Now the average age of first home buyers is 31, so let's say the youngest is 25. And for baby boomers, if you're over 55 and you purchased your property to live in, then you've pretty much missed the property bubble and would now own your property outright. That leaves those aged 25 to 55 holding Australia's mortgage debt. Looking at this group a little more closely, and you would assume that it's those aged 25 to 34 that have bought most recently and are most concerned about the property bubble. But it's not. It's you guys, aged 34 to 44, that have upgraded to houses in the last 10 years that are most concerned about the property bubble. Either way, it's those that have purchased in the last five years that have got the least value out of the property market. And it's the ages 25 to 55 that do the most spending. That's why it's times of asset price deflation that boring old cash becomes cash is king. Whenever the rate of debt money creation falls behind the rate of debt money destruction, the total amount of money in use will shrink. This is called deflation because the money supply is shrinking like a deflating balloon. The result is less money relative to the goods and services available. With less money around to pay for them, the price of goods and services go down. At first, this sounds like a good thing, and it could be, if money were not created as debt at interest. For anyone not in debt, deflation would be like a general dividend on money, paid in goods and services of our choice. It would be as if money were the people's stock in their own prosperous company. Besides, renting is living within your means, paying for something with the money you have today, rather than committing to obscene future repayments and betting on a single market, relying on interest rate cuts that may not even happen. But Sophia was less convinced and began analysing their financial situation which meant looking at what the investment properties were costing us, what our home was costing us, what our own living expenses were and what our income was, and then putting that all together. And we did that and it was, it was horrible, having to sit down and actually face the truth. But at the end of the day, we had in black and white where we stood financially and it wasn't, it wasn't a pretty sight. You probably could have exploded an atomic bomb in front of me and, and, and I would still been sitting there shocked, you know? Yeah. Um, it was very extremely, that was probably, probably the lowest point in my life. But he kept going, he kept forging ahead, irregardless of what the facts and figures were. And that form of denial is invasive and corrosive and toxic. And I didn't have the energy to keep fighting that. Sophia and Joe sold their investment units and their dream home on the coast and have since ended their relationship. I'm living in Bankstown, 
in a three bedroom unit and it's rented accommodation, somebody else owns and I'm the happiest I've ever been with no debt at all, not even credit card debt. I own my own car, no credit card debt and substantial savings in the bank. My life is simple and I'm happy. The realisation of actually having to pay down this debt will occur as property as a lucrative investment gradually reverts back to property being a place to live, plain old vanilla housing, like it should and has been for the last 50 years in Australia's history. This is the book we kept with the expenses in. Yes, it starts off with land 159 pound, a stainless steel sink, 1373, hardware, our refrigerator, that was a big expense, that was 60 pound. That was a lot then, wasn't it? Yes, third of the price of the land. The house all up cost us about 2,000 pounds. 2,000 pounds was roughly three times what Roger earned in a year. For 50 years after the Second World War, the average home had cost three to four times the average salary. But by 2005, that ratio had doubled, and in the big cities, it would go even higher. So before considering getting into debt, you are the average first home buyer in Australia. Even if you didn't buy the medium price unit at $400,000, or more likely that you weren't on the average wage, either way, the repayment situation described still reflects a loan of around $300,000. And if you're currently holding a large mortgage, consider your options to get out of debt, as I believe such an unaffordable property market cannot go up in value forever. What's your advice to individual Australians right now? Get out of debt. Simple as that. It's not that simple though, is it? It isn't in that fact, simple, it's not no, simple at all. It takes difficult decisions to get out of debt, but that's the only thing to do. If you're liquid and if you have a secure job, you will do very well out of the coming environment. But if you're not liquid, if your assets are tied up, and if your job is at all vulnerable, then it can be very dark times ahead. You are normal, and yes, property in Australia is terribly unaffordable. I believe that we're in an asset bubble that can't be sustained and whether it pops or hisses, it's better to rent and watch from the sidelines. The great Australian dream has endured and expanded. Where once home was about shelter and security, now it's also about wealth accumulation and a display of personal achievement and status. It's a dream for which many are finding it impossible to pay. We're certainly wanting to sell this afternoon. If you've come here to bid and you haven't yet bid, we've got $600,000 we hold. We're looking and as the number of mortgage defaulters continues to rise... We've lost everything. It's all gone. Perhaps it's time to reassess what lies at the heart of the Australian dream. I think what makes a good home is uh, something that, that's comfortable, and reasonable to maintain, um, and it doesn't have to be big. No, I think it's the two of us together and it wouldn't make much difference. Whether you're in a caravan, if you're happy together, that's, that's what makes a good home, really. Don't you think? Yes, yeah.